Distortion. Welcome to the podcast, Appetite for Distortion, episode number 400. Whoa. My name is Brando. Uh, with me for the first time, my new co host. We'll see how this goes. Harrison Rex, <laughs> aka Baby Brownstone. I haven't done. I've done a lot of radio with a lot of different people throughout my twenty years plus. Tommy Stinson, never with a newborn. So <laughs> with, if he cries, you know, no one wants to hear a crying baby. So uh, my wife's within an earshot to grab him. So right now the pacifier is doing its thing. He's Very, got a sweet child of mine. Uh, one yeah, thing. you're doing just great, just great, <laughs> nice. Well, I know you're you're a family man to kind of get things going. If you don't oh, mind, I've been, I've been there, been there twice. Any uh, advice you can give me? Um, you know, I always found it good to not take my my kiddos to work. <laughs> <laughs> you saying I shouldn't be doing this right now? <laughs> well, you know, we'll see what happens. He might, he might, he might add something to the whole interview there. Well, that's I think that's be, kind of the point. Be a good vibe. <laughs> He already uh, he did a whole blowout before the interview. I think he was nervous, so hopefully there you go. Perfect, he's okay. Perfect. He's okay. Well, speaking of giving birth to something, see, here's my terrible yeah. segue. You know, a few years ago, I know you've met so many people, especially the, with the way you tour and going to different backyards and different houses and everything. Because uh, you live in Hudson, I know that's no secret, upstate New York. Yeah, yeah. And my wife and I before him and when he gets appropriate you know age appropriate we'll take more visits to upstate and we did this random stop in hudson because it's a cute little town she always heard about it and i get out and i'm like is that tommy stinson i was like yeah hey tommy and i stopped you on the street you were kind enough to take a picture with me and i asked you about this album <laughs> cowboys in the campfire so many years ago so I would love to hear, you know, how you finally gave birth to this project that's coming out. Uh, well, I guess when I air this, it may be out, but June second, uh, yeah. wronger single is yeah. out now. So if you could tell me how you birthed this while I handle this guy, yeah, you know, I mean, it, it, it was a long burn because I was, you know, it kind of came on the heels of a bunch of different things, you know, me producing records and putting out records and bash and pop this and guns and replacement sets so in between a lot of my other things that i've been doing ship and i've been getting together to write and him and i've written songs together for 14 years now and he he uh he had wrote some of the stuff that was on my you know one man mutiny solo record as well as the bash and pop record um and other things and so it just took a while to finish and with our lives, you know, our lives in crisis, that whole thing kind of doing what it's doing. Uh, it just took a minute. And so finally, yeah, this, you know, we kind of finalized a lot of it this last year, um, just after the pandemic, it just seemed like, okay, it's put the nail in the coffin on this, so to speak, and get her out there. And uh, all said, I think the songs probably range in about, you know, eight to 10 years time, you know, from, mm -hmm inception to record you know how does that work when you start a song you have an idea then eight years later you know is it hard not to go back and be you know whether you want to redo something or you were not in the same mood and when you wrote the lyrics how hard is it to let things be uh, it's see it's, it's actually easier to let them be and let them kind of build on their own they they'll if they're good enough they'll draw you back um mm -hmm. one way or the other and i i had the kind of thing where I'll start a song, I'll start a song and come up with a very scant amount of it and have it, you know, somewhere to visit later. Or I'll just finish a song right there on the spot if I'm feeling that inspired. But um, you know, it's it's usually kind of a process of they kind of grow up like babies, if you will. And right. uh, you know, finally they get to that age where you're gonna send them off to college and you, you know, they mm. send them off in the world and 
to you later. If you need me, I'm around, you know, come bail you <laughs> and uh, you kind of support them like that. So, um, yeah, so, so a lot of these things just kind of sit around. Some of them, you know, uh, end up pretty immediately. A lot of it we toured behind for the last few years, um, you know, all over the place, you know, just playing them and letting them kind of form and change and evolve, you know, in front of people. That has been one of the most fascinating things about you. And I respect so much the way you've been touring this. Someone who's as accomplished as you, been around the world and then some, uh, hundreds of plays and I can't, what's the biggest audience you've ever played in front of? If you can just, that, if you know that quick stat, you know, is it 100,000? Is it 50,000 less as uh, you drink your coffee as I'm stalling for that? You know, I don't know. I don't know how many, I don't know how many people we've, I've never played in front of in any one given time. I think um, with guns, you really never know, especially when you get out of the country. Mm. When you're other, other parts of the world, you never know really what's what. But I think if I remember correctly, rumor had it that um, when we played Rock and Rio the first time, um, rumor had it that yeah, they said there were a couple hundred thousand people there but it was reported that were, there were as many as 500,000 people there for that show because they, you know, the promoters kind of did some stuff there that may or may not have been cosmetic, if you know what I mean. Sure, kosher. Mm -hmm. And so, so that would, you know, that's probably, that's probably is the goofiest, uh, <laughs> um, goofiest number I could probably give you. I think, you know, that's pretty good. Oh, of course. I mean, that being said, I mean, that, kind of proves where I'm going with this, that you want to play people's backyards and barbecues and houses and, and, and going to, and bringing really the music to the people, literally, you know, that word is overused. You're bringing it literally. You're not just, Hey, I'm playing at this amphitheater. I'm playing at this palladium. You're bringing it to the people. So what came about with that decision to do that? Because, and, and with that, is that easier than booking like a traditional tour since you're dealing with maybe traditional people? Like, just if you could tell us about how touring like that has treated you. Well, <laughs> it, it works out really good for me because I don't have the, the, um, I don't have the foresight to sit there and, and book a tour a year in advance, like everyone's doing. And, mm -hmm. and, um, even putting a record out of you. I mean, for me, I was gonna, I had this record sorted out to come out, um, at the end of last year but I had a dispute with the record company that was going to put it out and pulled it. And so yeah, I was talking to somebody yesterday about it. It's like the way I'm doing things, it's like I can book a gig in a month and go and do a little run of dates, you know, in a month's time. And um, I'm not paying club fees. Club fees have gotten kind of um, uh, the ones that are still open since COVID that is, a lot of the fees have gotten kind of expensive because they've got to run a business. And for me, I'm trying to run a business. And, um, and again, I'm not, I'm not booking things, you know, year or six months, even in advance. I, I kind of just go out when I want to, and I'm lucky enough. I can kind of do that. Just like, Hey guys, I feel like playing in July. Let's, let's, let's do some songs somewhere. <laughs> and I could throw it together pretty good and go out and make it, make it, I can make it worthwhile it ends up being a fun experience for everyone. And, and it is a lot less of a pain in the ass. So it's, 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 man, it's a manageable amount of work after spending so much time and, you know, traveling the world and stuff. I mean, I could never do it again. I, I, the, the, the work that goes into what guns does, I mean, people sit there and view that from the outside looking in as this, as one thing, but I'm here to tell you, I mean, other than the three, four hour show you're doing, there's a lot of fucking work involved and getting to and from, and you know, all that goes into that. It's a lot. And, you know, I'm not really, it's not really something I strive to, to do anymore. I did plenty of that with them. That was good. And I had, I have nothing but good memories and good thoughts about it. So um, I'm gonna leave it at that, but but uh, this allows me to go, you know, on a whim or I mean, it's basically on a whim because really 
I'm calling up friends and going, hey, you like playing out in your area of the fucking country right now. What do you guys, you know, got going on? <laughs> and That's so cool. Together, you know. That's so cool. That's so rock and roll. And and it reminds me, I mean, I wasn't around back then. And I'm an East Coast guy, but like the stories you would hear about Van Halen when they started playing background, uh, backyards and everything, just playing for their friends. So that's pretty special. Um, anyone, I guess, do, a lot of, do you meet a lot of friends along the way, new friends when you're oh, meeting yeah. new I'm fans? Playing, I'm playing a lot of places I play. I'm playing um, places I've played before this way. And, um, and you know, the, 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 the sort of the one thing um, that uh, I get a little pushback from, from the record company and, and other professionals is that, well, you're really only playing to your 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 base. You're not really playing to anyone outside of that because you're not playing the clubs and stuff. And I kind of went like, mm-hmm. so. <laughs> it's like I'm not I'm not at 56 years old trying to be a fucking pop star. I don't give a fuck. I just wow. gonna go play some shows when I want to, and you know, make sure I, uh, it works for me and makes enough money to kind of keep it moving forward. You know, and keep doing what I do. Right on. I love that. Um, where does i guess that personality come from and i guess this is my my segue into the style of the record because you played in big rock bands you know you had the punk influence but this is while it's called cowboys and the campfire and there's twang to it it's not a country record no uh, per se so how would you describe it uh because even my my dave matthews loving wife was really into it not dave matthews it's obviously not like that but i would love to hear how you would describe it to Maybe the non-fan, maybe the fan that doesn't know about you. Here, so here's your chance to <laughs> reach out to more than just the You know, uh, I hate all the different tropes and, and you know, things you can call it and different genres and all that stuff. I don't mm-hmm. really buy into that crap. But mm-hmm. really, um, to me, it's just a stripped down. It's a stripped down rock record for the most part, really. Right on. But, um, but uh, you know, Chip and I write in a particular way. It's like we write as a duo and the songs kind of dictate whether we want to go from there, whether it's, yeah, this one, you know, this one we, there's a half the record started with the two of us and John Doe from X playing bass, you know, in a studio in Austin, Texas. We did half the record that way. Okay. And then, and I was like, okay, so they, there's some with bass on it and there's some here and there's, there's this one with the piano on it. They just kind of let you know which you know what they want to be and 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 I follow that. We follow that. We try we basically record everything, you know, just the two of us and see where it takes us from there and what it, you know, what the song might want or need and take it as it comes. And so as a stripped down rock record, some of it has drums, some of it has bass, and and you know, most all of it has bass actually at this point, but um you know strings i hadn't used strings before one song seemed to really want strings so and yet in the opening track really seemed to want the mighty mighty boss tones horn section so we got that in the mix and you know um yeah you know so just kind of different things like that it just uh don't forget the ukulele uh, right what's that don't forget the ukulele, right? Oh, that's, yeah, me and the ukulele, of course. <laughs> Just because it's such a funny instrument. You know, it always, it, I don't know why, but it always really makes, makes me think of um, raindrops keep falling on my head. <laughs> you know? I don't know why, I don't even know if that's a ukulele that's on that song, but the ukulele, when you start playing, it always makes me think of that. That's funny. Well, it also makes, now that I think about it, the ukulele, because another, maybe you've heard of him, Paul McCartney plays that quite often. And there was a song that kind of that sounded very much like John Lennon's solo, if I dare say that, if it's sacrilege. I, th- I think it was Hey Man. So did you any Beatles vibes did you feel creating this record? Because it's a stripped down rock record, much yeah. like the Beatles would do. Yeah. Um, you know, heavily influenced by Beatles and Stones for sure. But um you know, the first time I picked up a ukulele, I, I wrote I wrote a song on it right in the spot. A song mm-hmm. called uh, "Match Made in Hell." Um, it's just it's just one of those things. I'm always messing around with instruments, different things. When I you know when I feel inspired and there's something new in front of me, I'll mess around with it until I come up with something. Uh, ukulele has been one of those funny things. I, I picked it up in a lark. It was it was shaped funny. I bought it in Hawaii on a vacation. I was like, that's kind of neat. And I was in a great place and mood. And I picked it up and I started playing it. It's like I write this song and and um. Cut to I have 
I have a collection of ukuleles now. <laughs> I have like five or six of them. I have one that's an eight string, like like an eight string bass kind of thing. I have a baritone ukulele. I mean, it's just goofy, but you know, you just get these things and you get in on these, you get on these rolls and you just kind of follow, follow where it takes you, you know? Yeah, that must be so fun to bust that out in the backyard because that seems like such an intimate instrument. Mm -hmm. uh to play when you haven't played those instrument shows yeah. oh what okay, lyric? i don't i don't play those i don't play it so much the shows when, when we do cowboys it's too it's a little it's for as small as it is it's actually kind of cumbersome if you're an actual guitar player okay which but i'm not wanna, <laughs> you gotta kind of be in a little kind of a place for it fair enough fair enough oh uh, what lyrics speak to you the most as this guy doesn't want to hear it oh he he's, he wants to talk about karma's bitch Mm -hmm. That's what he, he's telling me right now. He spoke his first words. I want to hear about Karma's bitch. Can yeah. you tell me about that? Well, it's a it's a story that Chip it's a crazy story. Me. It's a story a story about um about Chip's neighbor. He had a he had a neighbor when he had a house down in Maryland. Um, that the song he told me the story. That's the story of a guy that um was dating a woman who they were just terrible, terrible alcoholics and. Um, he left the woman to start dating his daughter, her daughter, which who was all, also a terrible alcoholic and actually died of it. Um, and one day we were cruising around and his place in Maryland, it was a little community where they cruised on golf carts or whatever. And, you know, to, it was really just a bizarre little area where it's all Trump people all this kind of thing and we're cruising around and because that's the guy that's the guy i was telling you about that wrote that that song we read like that's the guy i told you a story about mm -hmm. and i couldn't believe it i, I always thought he was you know you, you got to take chip with a you know sometimes a little bit of a question mark because you just <laughs> never know if he's making it up or not but that one was apparently a true story okay right on and i'm, I'm trying to look for it i think it was the hey man song that i previously mentioned that was political in nature but you didn't want to go too deep with it um is there anything that you you feel that you need to express i guess how do you feel about because it's it's hard to do that now in music or anywhere if you're if you know yeah the, the whole philosophy of uh you're a musician you can't express your opinion is is ridiculous um i guess do you do you look to anyone that inspires you about political music uh, how far would you want to go with that or is it just something you want to get off your chest in a light way yeah you know it's one of those things i'm not much i'm not much of an activist per se but i do care a lot and mm -hmm. i get in touch i have i have some people that i talk to and some people that are uh, some good friends of mine that are in the in, in politics and stuff like that but um that song is is is, is kind of a thought about you know there's so many you know, rural communities in our country where um, really the best job you can get would be to join the service. I mean, that's kind of how we're lucky enough to have a, you know, military really. Um, uh, and it just seems we don't take care of them really good enough uh, for what they do to keep us safe. And, um, and a lot of times because it is kind of the only decent job out there in rural America, it's like, I just kind of sometimes reflect and think, God, that's just, that's so unfortunate because we, because we don't take such good care of them, that that's all they have to really, to hopefully, you know, you know, get, get fortunate enough to where they can pay for university afterwards and do their bit, you know, that sort of thing. And so that song loosely touches on that and, and just my thought, my thoughts on that. And in the bigger scheme of things, I, I try not to be too political. It seems like if anytime I bring up politics, people, especially on the right, will fucking shut me down and be like, why don't you just stick to music, man? Well, you know, you know, you're talking about. And to which I say, why don't you just fuck off and fucking uh, and, and pick up a paper and fucking, you know, learn a little bit about history, maybe pick up a book and find out about what really the fucking Constitution really fucking says instead of what you think it says. I mean, and so I try to stay out of it because I know I'll go postal and I don't want to <laughs> go postal. Um, I've done I do my research and I, you know, I. Um, I read about the things that are historical that are just without dispute. I mean, come on. 
<laughs> the Holocaust really fucking happened. You fucking yeah, happened, you know? yeah, I know. Um, it's you know, it is mind numbing to me, and I won't go far into this. Just how fucking, and 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 I and I'll leave it at this. I don't know if it if it's necessarily a bad thing that this happened during Trump's tenure, but he did somehow open the door and the floodgates to the racists and the anti-Semites and all that. I, I don't know if he opened the door to the people that were already there just hiding and he just made it okay for them to come out. Maybe that's a good thing. At least we know who our neighbors really are. I mm. mean, I don't know. It's kind of, you kind of have to look at it like that, I think, and go, well, at least we know those people really are fucking out of their minds or or it's a bad thing that, you know, it, that they actually have a voice now. And that's unfortunate, I think. Yeah. Um, it is, I, uh, you know, because I have listeners and friends. I mean, I should say listeners uh, that all sides of this, the political aisle and, you know, we all meet here. This is kind of like where, we, you know, we all have that Guns and Roses connection or wherever you are, just kind of. But in my lifetime, I'm going to be 40 in a few months. I have never just seen so much division in my life and whether that's, you know, directly caused by that situation or whatever, you know, it's scary to bring up, you know, a new person and bring him up in the world where it's like this. So it nope. is a, it's, it's a new world to navigate. And I just want, I want to do my part and not bring up somebody who's an idiot. Because <laughs> exactly. it's just amazing. Yeah. The people that are unsure if the Holocaust happened or the earth is flat. It's just, I, it's just I insane, just heard someone from insane. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, someone told me about a base. I'm gonna leave his name out, but a basketball an NBA star who is a who's a, a, a believer that the world is flat. Kyrie and, Irving, I, I'll say it. It's <laughs> I know because it's public. Because it's public. Kyrie Irving is is the uh, yeah. Yeah, it's like, dude, how many airplanes have you been in? <laughs> Do you not see out the window? <laughs> you know, because I was fucking. I know, I know, I know, right? And I'm that's why I'm a Nick. I'm wearing my Knicks hat. Uh as in time I'm 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 playing uh I'm taping this just still in the playoffs. But yeah, because he was on the Nets, and it's just like really like I can't have this this somebody who's like representing Brooklyn where I was born and from and believing in this these oh, crazy man. things. So that's why I appreciate because look, it's the same thing if some people say to you stick to music. I don't believe in that. If they want to say, oh, stick to basketball, I don't believe that either. If you want to spout this ridiculous stuff, do it. But that's why I like to gravitate. I want him to gravitate towards people, you know, like Tommy Stinson, who's really out there meeting the people really worldly and and, and humble. That's yeah, something that really turns me off. He's at the arrogance <laughs> of just like, yeah, you know, I'm not going to believe everybody else. I'm going to believe in this crazy theory. It's just, uh, yeah, wow. it just, it makes you wonder. I mean, and, and, I'm a centrist. I don't, I don't, I, I completely back and believe in a two parts, you know, system, um, a two party system, because I think that conservatives has really good ideas and liberals have very good ideas. I think there, if you're a centrist, you know that both sides do have some intrinsic things going on that are the reason why we've lasted this long yeah. democracy, right? I agree. So maybe when you consider that, you have to really kind of, kind of go well it's on both sides but you really have to kind of go wow there's people there are it's you know the floodgate is open for crazy right now and unfortunately and i have two kids you have a new baby right there in your lap um one of the things that's coming to fruition from this with uh, both the fact of you know anti-semites and all this stuff the gun laws and things like that is a there is a huge manifestation um, over the last 10 years of childhood trauma with anxiety, suicide, drug addiction, and, and alcoholism, all this stuff. And it's coming from societal issues like these. And it's becoming, uh, it is becoming, a, I was at a, a gala event last night where they were talking about this, where it's very, it's like the numbers do not lie. You can't make it up how many kids are struggling and why they are there doing the research on it and figuring out it is way worse than we're talking about. But you have to be mindful of that as you're raising a kid to know 
the outside world is going to enter into that kid's mind and you're going to have to navigate how you parent that so that you keep them from the dark, you know, cause it is fucking dark out there, you know? Oh, absolutely. You know, that's my secondary theme is, uh, is talking about mental health and depression and addiction. So you obviously have a, a lot to say, you know, but you do it in a healthy way through music. And it's yeah. kind of interesting because uh, Duff McKagan just put out a video and uh, a new single and EP where he wrote a song in the middle of a panic attack. Um, he's talking about mental health that you're not alone. Is that something you you um, you are able to express yourself enough through music? Uh, is this was this album cathartic for you? Did you get out enough? Because again, you seem like you have a lot to say, but like this album took a while. Um, but this is your outlet. So I guess yeah. are you able to get you know are you able to voice and, and reach out to fans as, as as much as you would like to? You know, I I I feel like I do. I feel like um I don't feel like my work is done here. I think I I think I have a lot more to do and to say and to leave as a legacy, to be honest with you. So right on. in my in my mind, um I'm, I'm just getting started, you know, uh, and I have, I, it's funny. I, I, I was just texting with Duff last week. Um, he just reached out to me at, at, about some stuff and then we had a nice, a very sweet exchange. He's a very, he's a very sweet guy. I love, love him a lot. Um, but um, I, I didn't know he'd, I didn't know he'd put out a new song, which I got to go check out, but um, I loved his last band that he had. What was, the, um, what was his last group called again? Well, he had Loaded. Loaded. That's what it was. Okay, I, yeah. When they put out when they put out that first record of theirs, I was still in Gun. We were rehearsing in in L.A., and I think it was Bob. It was um, you know Tom or Bob, a couple of our guys at Rhodes guys, was just playing it in the in the studio as we were coming in. I was like, "Who's that?" And he's like, "This stuff's new record." I'm like, "Shit, man, that's great," you know. And then and that's and then cut to a week later, I met him in person, had coffee, and, and you know, had the whole thing. It was great. Uh, and I went on and saw those guys play as well. But, um, but uh, you know, I, I, I'm like Duff. Um, I think we're kind of in the same mindset on this, is that we do have a lot of work to do, whether it's writing and things to do, um, you know, not politically, but for our communities and things like that. Where right. I think um, we're both in a place, you know, and I think in, in life where we see the power of it, the power of music and and the the voice it gives us to the world and and how we can help people and stuff like that i think i think it's uh that said i think there's plenty of work to do to be done still awesome i love it to hear that because again i talk <laughs> about uh mental health i'm seven years without alcohol you know i spent my 20s not wanting to be on this planet yeah. uh next month i can't believe will be 10 years since my dad lost his, his uh, life to depression. Yeah. So just to be able to survive all that for me. And then, you know, two weeks ago, I have this guy, you know, and, and it's, I'm just a person. I think about that. I have listeners who appreciate what I do, but I'm like on a level of a Duff on a level of a Tommy Stinson where you guys have really been around, seen that. I think that just, it means a lot coming from a fan. If I can put my fan hat on for a second yeah. and know that we're not alone and yeah. You know, people just think, oh, rich rock star, you know, they have no issues. We have yeah. to, that's another stigma we need to break. You know, it doesn't yeah. matter if you have adoring fans, you're successful. It doesn't matter. You know, I had a great conversation with Dave Navarro about this. On, it doesn't matter. None of that is going to cure trauma. So uh, I do appreciate and, you. And, and David's, David's trauma, Jesus, it's a dark uh, story, man. Yeah. And, and, you know, glad he's still able to do it and still able to find an outlet for, for where to put all that i think it's it's important it's important to recognize i'm i'm, I'm proud, proud of you glad for you to and congrats on your seven years by the way but uh thank you um uh that's important and it's great that you have this outlet to you know encourage other people to to get on board and uh you know and like you said spread the word there's you're not alone there's a lot of help out there there's a lot of help out there if you seek it out wow absolutely you just got to ask for help um, I have, I, I'm not going to keep you here forever because I know you got a lot of interviews uh, mm -hmm. lined up, but I have a lot of listeners who are just excited to hear from you. Cool. And we're, we're on the topic of, of Duff. This is from uh, Danny Bigelow. Uh, when you got together with Duff in South America, I think, did they ever talk about maybe co-writing some songs or touring together at some point? 
Now, if that was the subject of this text, I, you know, your recent texting, you don't have to say anything. But it just seems like you guys are very similar personalities. It almost would seem too perfect for you guys to work together, in my opinion. That's a, that's a funny thing. I, I, we, I've never talked to him about it. We've only, you know, discussed and talked about, you know, things when I've seen him, uh, you know, outside of that, really, you know. Um, I haven't, I hadn't, I haven't spent a lot of time with him, to be honest with you. I spent some time with him, like I said, after her loaded and, and I met him, uh, you know, back uh, 10 years ago, probably more. Um, and, and that was that. And I um, haven't really spent any time since then, but I've, I've had contact with him, you know, through text and phone call, that kind of stuff. Um, no, it'd be, it'd be funny. I mean, we are completely kind of from the same background. I mean, I didn't know, um, we were playing the same clubs way back in the day before guns, well before guns, because replacements predate guns, as you know. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that's a funny thought. You have to ask, yeah, tell me, give me a call. <laughs> <laughs> Is it a trip to see him and Slash play some songs that you wrote during your time now? Uh, have you got, have you seen, whether it be in person or, uh, you know, online? you know, Slash and Duff kind of playing Chinese democracy songs. Is that interesting you know, to you at all? It's, it's, it was funny. I, I've been to a couple of shows. I went to a, a couple of shows with my buddy, Steve Koenig. Um, we're going to go see him in, in uh, Kansas in September and probably Saratoga as well. Oh, cool. oh, yeah, like that. Um, before Fortis's daughter goes to college, actually, we're going to, I think I'm going to try and make that show, but uh, mm. um, it, it's, it's funny to see, be on that side of the fence for one. Mm. Um, I, the, the, for one of the shows I went to, I can't remember if it was KC or Philly, but walking around with my buddy Steve Kennedy at the show and people were recognizing me going, hey, what are you doing here? <laughs> it was really, it was really funny because my buddy Steve is a huge Guns N' Roses fan and we were just, we were having such a laugh about it because we're walking around people are kind of like, wow, there's Tommy Stins, what the fuck are you doing here, man? There's like, the show like you are, you know? Um, and yeah, we had a really good time doing that. It was funny. I love that. Any chance for Cowboys in the Campfire to open for for guns? Since you're oh, still you know, kind of not, not not of that ilk. Not of that. Okay. Ilk. I, don't, I don't know that I see that fan base taking kindly to it either. But I don't I, know. What? Okay. You know, I, I get some people that you know that come out to my shows that are big fans and stuff of guns and all that. I, I get that you know a little bit, but um, you know. I, I think probably more so because Chip, he's kind of a Chip. He's got some some chops on the old guitar, so it, you know we'll see. Okay, okay. Well, as far as the tour itself, um, I know you have some dates planned. Well, this is August. Ask for James William Ray. Any you're going to go overseas? You going to go to the UK, or is this all going to be in the states for now? You know, there's a pretty good chance we'll go over there. It's just a matter of lining it up. I've got we just. Um, I just got a whole list of interviews for them for you for European markets next week, but you know, um, it, it's it's a daunting task for me to want to leave the country on the one hand mm. to work, to go play shows. It's daunting for me to want to do that. Um, to go to another country without playing shows is a whole other thing. Because um, I may be looking to relocate for my my final years who knows um, <laughs> sorry i scared him by laughing sorry. You know, that kind of thing. but uh yeah we'll see you know there's talk of australia and and, and asia and all that stuff but you know i got a 15 year old and i you know uh if it sounds right it sounds fun i'll do it but if it doesn't sound right and if it doesn't sound fun especially i won't do it because i <laughs> i've had i've spent enough of my my life traveling the world and playing you know, mm -hmm. doing, doing the gig and, and all that stuff. Uh, there's certain parts of it that I don't really feel like doing anymore. Right on. And you've earned that. And yeah. I, want, I wanted to ask uh, your daughter, and correct me if I'm wrong, is this the same daughter that you, is why you, you took a, a leap of absence, or I guess when you left Guns N' Roses to take care of? Yes. And okay, cool. Yep. Uh, I, had to, just, I had to walk away for that. Which, I mean, I, was it an easy decision? I, it's because some people might be like, that's a hard decision to leave Guns N' Roses. But I mean, I look at this guy. I don't know if there's anything I wouldn't do for him, but I've never yeah. been in Guns N' Roses. So I don't know. I was I got into a particular situation where um, 
I needed to be home. I wasn't in the trips that were, the tours that were being talked about were, I had to make that kind of decision. And it was, a, it was one of the hardest decisions I had to make that I, okay. that I had no choice about. I really had to do it. So, okay. uh, you know, it, 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 it put me in a bad light with Axel, obviously, because he was he was upset with that and didn't wasn't pre, didn't appreciate that at all. I can't help but think that if he were to look back now and look at look at what he did and what he's done since I quit, he might kind of be like glad that happened. <laughs> mm. <laughs> you know what I mean? I mean, mm. for him to go out and tour with ACDC was a huge thing in, in, in the rock, in the annals of rock and roll anyway, but I can't imagine him now looking back and going, I wouldn't have probably had to, had done that had Tommy not quit. And we'd just done those tours and just kept on going, getting the old band back together wouldn't have happened. Um, at least not then, might have maybe now, but I think everything's rocking and rolling for him pretty good. I can't imagine him, uh, you know, not being a bit grateful. Mm. well that's unfortunate i guess um yeah, it's, it's it's part of the process it's part of the life it's a, it's 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 all good stuff nothing bad about it okay know? right on well i'll switch it to a interesting gear because obviously i'm going to show him this video when he's because he doesn't know anything right now yep. when did your daughters realize you know or, or do they look at you as dad do they look at you as a musician tommy stinson with fans replacements guns and roses collective soul or do they look at you as just dad? They're like, oh, he's, 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 I don't like him. He's, he's nerdy. He's just a dad who wears, you know, thinks he's cool. Yeah. Both of my daughters probably look at me differently, but, um, you know, I think they appreciated the, the glitz and glamour of the things they saw, but they also just know I'm just dad. Hmm. You know, the, 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 you know, they both have seen pieces of that, uh, throughout where, you know, they've been around it and, you know, they still it's you're still just dad right okay right on i'm looking forward just, to that you're just, you're just gonna be dad dude <laughs> where yeah when well, he's not impressed at all that's not okay. at all that's okay give buddy. a crap <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well he gives right. some craps but not the kind of uh we're yeah. talking about um <laughs> there you go what are you most forward uh, looking forward to most people hearing this record cowboys in the campfire what's the what's you're most excited about or is there a certain message that you want people to what do you want people to take away from wronger yeah you know just yeah, check it out enjoy it. if you like it great if you don't don't listen to it I, mean, <laughs> I don't really i don't um there's no one song i think that i that i love i think they um what what we did with that record is we just we tried to make all the songs as uh, strong on their own right as we could was trying to um uh, you know, in, in the past, you, you're some of your favorite records, there's going to be the singles, and then there's going to be the album tracks, right? And the album tracks, the ones that aren't necessarily singles, but they're good songs in their own right, or sometimes not so great. And they're just kind of fluff because they didn't have enough great songs, whatever. Um, you know, we try to kind of approach it where, you know, we put the same effort into each song so that they all could be singles or they can all be album tracks. And they basically uh comprise the whole of one record and as opposed to you can take them apart and you know separate them in a way and one last one because you people can watch the video for dream right now on your youtube page where was that shot was that shot in your neighborhood no it was uh, shot in the lower east side new york i'm a crappy new yorker i'm not recognizing yeah, right, that right down by niagara okay yeah okay very cool. We uh, well, went and did it guerrilla style. We, we, I didn't have the money to stop traffic and shit like that. So <laughs> we sat there literally waiting for the lights to stop and uh, to, to turn red and the, the cars to stop. And then we'd roll tape as we were walking the street, um, being mindful that, okay, now that the light just turned green, get back on the curb. You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's New York. I'm sure we're used to that, but uh, that, that's, that's incredible. And that just fits your personality and everything. Just, if it works, great. It's kind of like he he made he made it the whole episode. Yeah, he made you know, a, a couple no times. Arrested, he, so that's great. He got Harry. I know he got arrested for you, Tommy. Thank you so much for your time. Congratulations. I know this has been a labor of love for so many years. 
to put out Wronger, Cowboys in the Campfire. Uh, when you come around to New York, I don't know if he'll be old enough to take him to his first concert, hey, uh, but hopefully, technically, his first concert was uh, Buckethead Brain and uh, it, with, um, why am I forgetting the name of the, the band? Praxis. So your your former bandmates, are bucket, using my wife's stuff. Buckethead stomach, and Brain. Wow. And, and Bill Laswell had a band called Praxis. Wow. Okay. Funny. <laughs> okay. Uh, fair enough. I didn't, I didn't know Buckethead was still out there doing that thing. Wow. He, well, he's doing a few things. I mean, I'm assuming you haven't spoken with him in a while, but uh, he's coming out with an album with an Iranian singer, Azam Ali. He's putting out still his, you know, 20 albums a year. Still doing. Was that the most interesting character you've ever worked with was Buckethead? Not the most interesting. There were a lot of other things I would use in that, but not interesting. Being interesting wouldn't be the operative in that one. Okay. I guess I was being. <laughs> I'll leave uh, it at that. I'll leave being, it at that. <laughs> to, to go bring it back to the political, I guess I was being a little too centrist on that. I was a little being a little too uh, <laughs> neutral on that. I gotcha. I gotcha. Tommy, thank you so much. I hope we get to do this again and, uh, and just take care. Sure enough, man. You have a great day and congrats on the baby there. Thank you so much. So until the next episode, when will you see it? Well, in the words of Axel Rose concerning Chinese democracy, I don't know if soon is the word, but you'll see it. <laughs>